All right, and sort of like what we did for magnetism, we start off with some simple ideas and gave you some ways to work through those problems. I want to do magnetism in the same way. Today we're going to do the sort of ideas of magnetism, and then tomorrow we'll apply uh, the last applications of how we use magnets in motors and in uh, electromagnets and that stuff. So let's first talk about magnetism. It's, of course, an attraction and a, or a repulsion that is set up because of the nature of the atoms. If the atom has such uh, a set of electrons in there that move in a certain way, they'll be magnetic. As a matter of fact, a magnet is any object that particularly attracts those few elements that are naturally magnetic. Those few elements are nickel, cobalt, and iron I have up there. Um, and so they generally have uh, display some magnetism. They have a, the, the way that the electrons move sets them up to be extraordinarily more magnetic than other materials. Um, for our planet, it's got iron and uh, nickel as the core, a little bit of cobalt too, but those create the magnetic uh, field that goes around the planet. Now, is a secondary sort of statement is if we think about the planet and our pole, okay, if we think of that as a, a magnet inside, here's our spinning axis, you know, that where the, I, the world turns. If your if your um, bar magnet or your your compass points to the north pole, the north on your on your compass points to the north pole. What kind of a pole is this up here? Well, if your north always points to it, the south is down here. That means the north must be pointing to its opposite. So on the Earth, even though we've gotten used to calling it the North Pole, it's a magnetic South Pole. Um, that may blow your mind in that thinking. Um, but we called it, it should be our North Seeking Pole, or I suppose it's the north side of a magnet seeking pole. But we called it the North Seeking, or we call it North Pole so much that it's, it's got that term now, and we got our directions all uh, kind of set in there. So the world actually has a South Pole um, in the uh, Arctic up north. Care of this. Now, the strength or the unit of uh, magnetism is usually a gauss, and it's pretty small. As a matter of fact, the Earth's magnetic field has got five zeros, sorry, four zeros and a, and a five, so it's a half of a um, ten thousandth. So it's point one, two, three, four, and a five. That's the na natural strength of the Earth's magnetic field. So let's go on to like a bar magnet. A bar magnet's, you know, I mean, it's literally half a gauss is what the Earth's is. But 100 Gauss would be a small bar magnet that, you know, kind of gets beat around and doesn't sort of sticks to the fridge. Um, in a sunspot, it's interesting that it's about a th 100, uh, sorry, 10 times stronger, 15 times stronger. They have massive uh, currents of charged particles moving around. That's what causes that magnetism there. And if you compare that, that's almost the strength of our neodymium magnets, which are some of our stronger magnets we use today in toys. Um, but a big electromagnet that is being used to lift cars and garbage, that's 15,000. Gauss, or now we're going to switch over to Teslas. It's about one and a half Teslas. Um, the strongest lab magnet joint, uh, have created it's it's around ten Teslas, and then a neutron star has some conditions in there where there's massive, um, fast moving charges, and that creates this amazingly. It's a billion, um, a billion test uh, Gauss, a billion Gauss. So anyway, um, not that you could relate to that, but as long as you're looking for a large value. Typically, we're going to represent magnetism in a field way, just like we did for, for current. And instead of electric field, we're going to have a magnetic field. It's going to start from the north. It's going to make its way around, and it's going to always terminate in the south. Now, one thing that's different about magnetic fields, it doesn't have a one direction. You can't just have a north pole or just a south pole, like plus or minus charges were, uh, because the way that the magnet is set up at the atomic level, you'll always have a north and south. Uh, so there's no separating those two. One thing, though, is if magnetic fields set up, and there's some there's some advantages to showing a field that these these this way you can tell if there's a magnetic field coming out of the paper, and they're going to look like arrows. It's the point of an arrow is where you can think about it. So this one's where the magnetic field is coming out towards you, and these are like the fletchings of the back side of an arrow. You know the the feathers. So that's what you see when you see X's or pluses. Um, that's going into the field. That's standard notation uh, to show magnetism. And again, the more lines in an area, for instance. These have the same strength as this field because they're the same distance apart. But an area down here is much stronger magnetically than maybe someplace out there. This is a stronger magnet. One is closer to, um, it's also right under the pole itself. So that's one way you can tell is the strength of the magnet is dependent on the number of lines that you have. Magnetic fields interact with each other. 
you know, the North can now go and make lines of uh, magnetic force just straight into the other um, into the other magnet, and so that'll actually cause them to get closer, and that's why the attraction gets to be greater. Two Norths, for instance, actually start to bend those lines away, and there's a bigger repulsion. And so same poles repel. That's not anything new. These are some interesting things that can be done with magnets, though, uh, that uh, is interesting that a moving charge is inter will interact. As a matter of fact, it has to be a moving charge before magnetism and charge interact with each other. So let's say we take and shoot a positive charge in between these two magnets. Now, most current and magnetic sort of phenomena are going to be run by right-hand rules. So if you take your right hand, and you're going to point your fingers in the field you know, from north to south in this direction, and then your thumb points along the, the way that that charged particle is moving, the palm of your hand is going to show you what force is going to be on that particle. So if you shoot this, it's going to get a force that's going to be pushing it up. As a matter of fact, it's not just up. It's always 90 degrees to its motion. So if it's moving like this, it's always going to be 90 degrees to that motion. So it's going to actually encourage it to go into a circle. If it's just the right, it'll just hit a circular path. If it's stronger, it'll actually cause it to spiral into to stopping. If it's fairly weak, here, let's pull that out of there. Um, it may only curve it and just leave the magnetic field. If Once it's left the magnetic field, it won't uh, move anymore. What's also interesting is that if it's a negative charge, remember, current is always being assumed as positive. If it's a negative charge, it's going to curve in the opposite direction. So here's my right hand field is there, the current is there, and it's opposite of what my palm would be if it's the negative charge. So that's the right hand rule for um, movement. How much force that, that charged particle ex it feels, it depends on how much charge it is times the strength of the magnetic field, and then times the motion of how fast that particle is moving. The faster it is, the more magnetism it feels. Um, and if it isn't, like here's the field going this way with my fingers, but the particle is moving sort of not at a perpendicular, it's a glancing sort of blow. You know, so if here's the field strength of my fingers, and it's not going perpendicular like this, but it's going that way, we want to know the component of motion that's perpendicular to that field, and that's what the sine theta comes in. If it's going perpendicular to the field, don't worry, you just take the charge times the velocity times the field. Matter of fact, you can even figure out what the radius, how, what, how tight of a circle that's going to make if you know the mass of that particle, how fast it's moving, divided by the charge of the particle and the field strength. It'll give you the, the turning radius of that particle as it's moving around. And that was important because they, they actually measured those kinds of things. Sometimes they put a little cloud chamber, and you could see a particle leave a vapor trail behind, and they were actually determining things like the charge and the uh, mass of electrons and protons. Um, so that was an important historical formula that was used. It's going to be, actually, this came from the centripetal force, which we sort of gave a quick nod to when we were talking about that in that chapter, back in forces in the first unit. Now, the last two that are actually interesting and cool, um, in addition to those, um, is that when moving electricity is happening, it creates its own magnetic field around it. It follows a right-hand rule. So if you're saying, here's the voltage, or here's the current going this way, again, the positive flow of charge is going this way, then my fingers will point in the direction of the, of the uh, magnetic field. And as you get further, of course, these get bigger and bigger, and there's more space between them. So the field falls off when I draw a little box. You don't get as many lines. Uh, but that's the direction of the magnetic field as it goes around by falling through the right-hand rule. The strength of it? This is a constant that depends on the material around there. Like if it's air, it's got a certain value. If it's plastic around the wire, so it's, it's, it's called a dielectric constant. Um, but that's the current times the area um, of the circle uh, for your distance out from there. So as you get further, it's 2 pi r. The total amount of current is actually taking up a certain area. So it's the current times the area around what you're trying to figure out um, where that um, field is. The last one is that a wire itself, if it's, if it's traveling, if you've got current inside that wire that's carrying this, um, not only does it create a field, but then to figure out what that member forces, uh, fields can interact, but to figure out how much force that is, is you're going to put your fingers in the direction of the force, your thumb in the direction of the movement of the current, and you can calculate what that force is. That force is going to, in this case, be in the direction of your palm, and that's going to take the current times the length of the wire that's in the magnetic field times the field itself. And of course, if the wire isn't going perpendicular to the electric field and it's going at some angle, that angle between the field and your wire is going to then have to be used as sine theta so that you can figure out what portion of that electric current is actually 
perpendicular to the to the lines. And then you're going to get a force in Newtons, and that'll literally lift the wire up or pull it down. And there's applications of that too. So those are the fundamental kinds of ideas about um, current, and you're going to get some practice problems in addition to the ones for capacitance. But these are the intro kinds of ideas of magnetism, and tomorrow we'll get into applications.